Welcome everyone to this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. I am Tim Grady and I'm here with Lou Weiss, who is the founder of Manufacturing Talk Radio and the president of All Metals and Forge Group. And joining us is John Aplinel. John is with uh, Pipeline Advisors. John, I was reading a little bit about the company. I enjoyed the comment that said the shortest pencil has the longest memory. Thanks for joining us. It's a Tim Lou. It's an absolute pleasure to, uh, you know, to, to be on board with this. The conversations with Lou. I think we're a lot of the same mind around here, et cetera. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. The Thank you, Pat. Shortest pencil has the longest memory. The shortest pencil has the longest memory. It goes with your saying, Lou. If it isn't in writing, it didn't happen. There you go. Okay. Let's go. So, so John, uh, Tightline Advisors, what do you folks bring to the table? And I know it's a lot of really good things to help for us manufacturers, which is what we're based in. Well, Tim, thank you. Thank you for, for letting me jump into my elevator, elevator pitch. I mean, the, the main thing in the years of experience, and it's, 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 it's not all been good experience. But it's been valuable experience, uh, you know, being involved with a family-owned company and the transition and the events of 2008, 2009, recovery from there. A lot of good learnings, a lot of tough learnings, but a lot of good learnings. And to me, what what I walked away with uh, out of it, and what Tightline's advisor is about, is a different way of creating value, sustainable value in an organization. And for us it's in the gross margin line. And for us really is the focus on the cost of goods. Most operations have some levels of inefficiencies which can be measured, et cetera. Our manufacturing operation probably operated about 50%. If you can go from 50 to 60% and you go from 50 to 75, that's a 20 to 40 to 50% improvement. And as you get tighter and, and greater understanding, not only do you reduce the hours, the need for inspection disappears, inventories disappear and if you do it the right way what concurrently happens is your lead time shrink your on-time delivery is better your external failure is uh, is improved and therefore your competitive position is improved your margins are improving and you don't have to raise your prices and a lot of this can be done without capital now i, un I understand that's a mouthful that i was going through it touches on a lot of different but to me, it's, a, it's a, an absolutely wonderful way to, to operate a company. It's something I wish I understood years ago. Well, one of the things that uh, Tim and I, over the 10 years, as of two days ago, uh, what we discovered is that manufacturers, generally speaking, they know how to make things, they know how to manufacture things, they know how to package, ship it, and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of things that they don't know about their businesses because the business evolution, their evolution, the marketplace evolution has moved forward and they haven't. They've been here. And one of, that's one of the things that Tim and I try and bring to the audience is that evolution, you have to catch up to the evolution. You have to understand what's happening and going to happen. And, and you bring a lot of that to the forefront. Well, what I think happened, and I experienced it myself, you know, you sit in the corner office and what do you get? You look at balance sheets, you look at income statements. Yeah, you do walk the floor occasionally. And you can have your qualitative reports, your downtime reports, your health and safety reports. But what we never did was we never took those, those type of reports and understood that level of inefficiency to get the organization. Now, that's not, that wasn't coming from me and what we were talking about. You know, the hierarchy of the organization, you know, the CEO on top and the, you know, the, the workers down at the bottom. Well, basically, we took it and turned it upside down that we had to go back and support the organization, give them the data in the right way. Because you're sitting in that corner office, aside from the sheets I told you about, there's a cacophony of issues that are going on, all the noise on the manufacturing floor. Well, how do you start sifting that out? How do you start, how do you start going after that? You can't handle all that from the corner office. The more brains you can get organized in the right way to go after the biggest continuing issues first, the better off you're going to be. And just keep driving it. 
and you know reward your employees accordingly. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit on how you know how I suggest doing that. But get everybody aligned with you and go forward. You bring up their capabilities and the capability of the organization. Well, that's that's true, uh, and. Uh... One of the other things that we have found, Tim and I, is that marketing, which is a very big component today, and it has been, but it's been growing and it's digital and it's all of that. That's one of the major, major areas that manufacturers don't know and don't understand and haven't gotten it yet. And, you know, Tim, do you have anything to add to, the, to that aspect of it? I guess, John, what we've experienced is that because manufacturers are very good at what they do, they don't necessarily focus on telling their story. Right. And, and right. that's where they, they tend to misfire. And I, I don't know if, if Tightline gets in the, into any of the aspects of marketing for their clients. I, we, we don't, but let me tell you what we do do with it, though. Yeah, I, I'm sure you heard, and I'm sure, and, and and if you heard, you know there is controversy around things like ESG, you know, environmental, social, and governance, etc. You know, a lot of companies can go out there and say they are. Uh, by the way, what did I read yesterday? That FTX, that company that just went bankrupt in in crypto, had a better ESG score than mobile did. <laughs> so uh, just to kind of give you. Uh, the relationship on what's going on and how it works. Uh, as, I, as I was saying, a lot of people can greenwash themselves. They can throw solar panels in, or they can try to recycle water. They can do some other things, et cetera, and try to pat themselves, et cetera, on the back going forward. The approach we take, and your gross margin line go back to more and more consistent output for less units of input, is your gross margin. And what we mean by more and more consistent, you know, less scrap, less waste, you're getting more out of the cavitation of your molds. So the power you're putting in is being spread over more units. The scrap rates are starting to come down. So and the environmental aspect of ESG naturally starts coming out of this. As you continue down the path and the gross margin goes in and really improves, start looking at alternative materials. Then you can start putting the investment in either newer and more efficient equipment, molds, do your solar panel, panels then, but not when your margins are compressed and, and beaten up with. The social aspect of it, as we said before, we're going to get our employees involved in it. And what we suggest and we advocate doing is, if you're able to go back in and drive that improvement in your gross margin, it's going to fall down to your EBITDA. If you show it in such a way that's sustainable, your multiple is going to improve, and therefore the value of your company is going to go up. Take those same dollars that you saved in the cost of goods, put that over the new valuation, and give that back to your employees in the form of real or synthetic equity. If they want to cash out, fine. You know, let them go cash out. But now you've got them aligned with you as you're going forward and just continue to drive it. As I said before, your capabilities then will get better, the people's capabilities, and then start looking for the complementary type businesses you can bolt on, bring to you, and start the process over again. Anyway, that's, uh, again, you go back to the marketing, but the ESG aspect of it, you are naturally doing good things that you should be telling people. It's not greenwashing, it's a, it's a result of how you operate. So, John, just so our audience knows and understands that over a period, of, a long period of time, you know what you're talking about. So give us a little bit about the history and the methodology of what you're doing and have done. I started, it was, it was a family home business. Uh, just to get into it a little bit, my, my father in 1949 received the, the patent for the first working, I'm looking up at a, on top of the desk there, forgive me, but the uh, first working aerosol valve. Uh, from that, you know, from those humble beginnings in a machine shop in the Bronx, uh, he ended up with 22 countries around the world, uh, all, the, all the major clients, the P&G. That's, the Bronx, that's Bronx, New York. Bronx, New York. <laughs> Bronx, New York. 
<laughs> so, uh, but what's the, believe it or not, was a Dodgers fan and a Mets fan, not a Yankees fan in the Bronx. So t- tough man. So um, uh, from that, and to make an aerosol valve, you have to injection mold, you have to high speed assemble, you have to form metal. Uh, so we did that. And he, uh, as I said, we got to about 22 countries worldwide, all the major customers, SC Johnson, P&G, Clorox, Record Ben Kieser, Unilever, you know, around the world. Um, he passed away in 2003, and I won't go into all the details of it. Uh, we were doing fine, and you know, after after he passed away, until uh, about 2008, we had borrowed some money at the time, estate issues, etc., and uh, damn near killed us. But during that time, uh, in association, uh, even some a little bit with Fordham University, but we also uh, uh, I got uh, my finance degree at Fordham, but. We also got involved with Fordham University as W. Edwards Deming recommended through Joyce Orsini, one of his disciples, to work at Fordham University. I'd gone to a couple of Deming lessons. We had a lot of quality inspection, even though we were automated. My father loved volume and speed. The accuracy part, we could use a little work with. So some of these concepts made sense to me. And we started rolling into the lean, et cetera. But it wasn't until after the crisis, the financial crisis hit it. We had to go through restructuring. We hadn't actually sold some of the company, et cetera. But I got a chance to go down to our plant in South Carolina and rolling it into the income statements, rolling it into the operational side of it. Then it became clear to me that, you know, how this could, in, in, in a continual and driven fashion, the, the obstacles to productivity out of the way could turn, turn an organization around. And that's, that was the genesis of, of tight line. We focused on quality, we focused on downtime, material loss and health and safety. And it wasn't done because of any great ideas on my part, it was getting the brains of the organization involved. And the coolest part of the whole thing was watching the successes happen on the floor and watching everybody literally either get converted or high-fiving the other guys. Oh my God, this worked, do you believe it, et cetera. You know, it, the people part is the best part of it. Uh, Ron, I'm just curious, as, as you have gone through this experience over and over and over with different companies, how many of them are surprised by what was achieved versus what they thought? And, and going in, many of them probably thought, eh, they're probably not going to get us much benefit. And then in, they get inv- a great surprise. In, invariably, what happens is you get the leaders of the organization and you start flow charting out the process. Just, you know, how does it go from this operation? Then you go to inventory, right? You do this, you, you lose stuff here and you have measurements here. And just, what happens here? Well, I don't really know what happens there. And it's, you know, they can't, they've got, geez, that really, that, geez, I really don't know. You know, I don't go with you on the floor and see what happens. And, you know, in every corner of every organization, there's always an aha moment. Uh, I mean, now, don't get me wrong. There's also other you know, moments where you're just not gonna break through. I mean, certain guy, we know it all, I, I, I get it. You know, that's, you know, if and when the time comes around to it, but invariably there's just this great, aha, I get it now, I understand. I had a friend of, our, a friend of mine I was working with, he had a wood distribution company. You know, it killed dried wood, et cetera. So we're going up, they had delivery systems. That really wasn't manufacturing, there's more logistics. But you know, with, with one truck, they were getting six deliveries a day. That was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, serving Greenwich, Westchester County, a lot of driving around with it. But we started laying out the process and they said, you know, we gotta get another truck. We gotta do this, we gotta do these other things. And well, what we invariably ended up doing was we went from five or six deliveries a day to nine to 10 deliveries a day with better customer service. And you know, now you needed the truck, but now you're getting one truck to handle 10 orders a day as opposed to five or six. And your margins you know, just start blowing away. But those are the examples. If, if you can get someone to stop thinking by walking them through the process, they're parochial and have all the knowledge. Because again, the corner office, God bless you, you know a lot of what's going on, but you don't have all the details of every operation in every plant. So anyway, so yes, Tim, to answer your question, 
there's a lot of, you know, it moments that, that, you know, that happened that people just didn't realize they didn't know what they didn't know. I know that FedEx and UPS went through a study like this some years ago because they were trying to use less gas, make their deliveries more efficient, and they rerouted their trucks so that in most cases, the trucks would be taking a right-hand turn on the route. So they didn't have to stop at a, at a stoplight. They could stop and go at a stop sign. Uh, it was just simply a more efficient way to drive and run a route. It was, it was really brilliantly done. So let, let, let me add a little bit to a FedEx story on that. Same friend of mine, it was the wood distribution. Sitting around, kind of going through it one day. And this was, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago. I'm a big fan of Waze. You know, I, I, my mother lives not that far, but I use Waze to go to my mother's in case of travel. So, you know, I've gone through the process and I'm thinking, you know, again, I know less about the operation than they do. And I'm sitting there, we're, we're in our kitchen and I look out the window and a FedEx truck comes up behind, you know, comes up downstairs making a delivery. So then, okay, he does deliveries, you know. So I go run downstairs, I ask him. Now this was before this study you were referring to. So I go downstairs and I ask him, I said, hey, how do you guys go from location to location? You use Waze, do you program? He goes, man, no, we don't, but that's something like that, it'd be great. And I kind of walk away going, oh my God, we're <laughs> about to, we're about, this little operation is about to go in to do something that FedEx wasn't doing at the time. And it's just, and it's not because of me doing, but it's, it's, there's a great William E. Simon quote. I gave this to Lou the other day. The, the William E. Simon's quote, and we go back to productivity. This is when he was treasury secretary and, and the importance of it, that productivity and the growth of productivity should be the first two economic considerations at all times. It is through those two things that innovations, jobs, and wealth are created. And that little innovative type discussion, you know, when we're trying to think our way through how does it work better that somebody like FedEx hasn't even used yet, it's kind of cool and to me validates the, uh, you know, the, 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 the quote of Mr. Simons. Anyway. No doubt. So when you're inside an organization, you talk about gross margin improvement. What are you looking at, John? I'm sorry, I broke up a little bit. What am I looking at? Yeah, are you looking at, I imagine you're looking at inventories, uh, operations, processes. What are all the pieces of the puzzle? Well, the, 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 fir the first thing I'm looking at, I mean, we, you go in gross margin. At that point, I really don't care about the revenue line as, as part of the gross margin. I'm looking at the cost of goods. And I want to go back then and see how the operation is divided, what the different parts are. And I think I'm going to mention, but what I go after is the qualitative data, the downtime data, the, uh, 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 the health and safety data, and the material loss data. I mean, we'll flow out the inventory, et cetera, but as, as, as we could go back into and get the obstacles to productivity out, and one of them being the change over time, as that daily output gets greater, the question would be, guys, do you really still need this inventory? Can we move the two operations together? Can we move them closer? Why do you keep going to a warehouse back out again? I don't necessarily focus in on the inventory number as, oppo as opposed to its effect on the overall flow. But once once the once the uh, uh, once the operating departments are at a uh, uh, a stable higher level, that's when we'd start addressing the inventory. But in the What's meantime, exciting already, about that? you're already starting to save. You're already starting to save on the hourly rate because the first hourly rate that drops down will be your overtime. And one of the things I used to hear, and I'm sure you guys hear it in manufacturing operations, you'll get in there and people, yeah, those people on the floor, you know, they're trying to milk the overtime. They're the, most everybody on the floor isn't trying to milk. They got 16 year old kids to play. They want to see the games. They don't want to work weekends. You know, they don't want to work additional hours. You know, a little bit in the pocket's great, but that's part of the reason we come back and we do that comp on the back end of it. As those numbers start coming down, give a little bit back to them, man. You got fans for life. In fact, well, the other but sorry if I could jump back into, into that compensation part. The other part is 
they are going to make sure they are policing the floor instead of you to make sure everybody is pulling their weight. And the ones that don't, you're going to hear about. <laughs> well, you know, that's interesting because what manufacturing is looking for and needs today are younger, skilled workers. And those are the people who live and die by how efficient is this operation. And they look at, at uh, you know, process improvement and say, why are we doing it this way? And, I, and I've, I've worked with all kinds of companies and their comment typically, well, that's the way we've done it for 40 years. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. My old man was one of them. And I love the guy, but he was, you know, a hundred percent, the same thing. Exactly. Sorry. I didn't mean to jump in on you on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Because that's exactly what we run across. And I know that, uh, manufacturers have a hard time working with that because oftentimes that 40 year process or 20 year process is tied to an employee or a group of people who've been there since the year of the flood. And they know if they tweak it, somebody's got to retire. It, it, and that's it, often it, not a fun decision to have to make. A hundred percent. To support your point, Tim, uh, in 1994, All Metals and Forge Group uh, went after uh, ISO 9000 registration. And <clears throat> the employees at that time said, well, what do we have to do that for? We're doing it this way and it's been fine and so on and so forth. And they're going on and on and on about why, why, and the classic line was, why do we have to listen to a foreign country? Now the foreign country, in case the audience doesn't know, was the Institute of, uh, I'm sorry, the International uh, uh, Standards Organization, which is in Switzerland. So here we are, in America, we're listening to this little country about a new type of uh, standards program and uh, quality program, and why do we have to listen to them? So anyway, to make a long story short, it took us a year. We finally got the registration. The day that we got our certificate, the very day, one of our salespeople gets a phone call from a client and says, can you help us out with this, this, and this? Um, well, yeah, uh, we can, but well, wait a minute, but our client says, I have to buy it from an ISO registered company. And the salesperson, Paul, said, yes, we have the registration. <laughs> and he got a $50,000 order the first day that we had the certification. And I haven't heard another peep out of anybody since then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these kind of process improvements are so vitally important, John, and it doesn't take, as you said, it is going to take a lot of money, but more importantly, it will save you a lot of money. It, it becomes a self-liquidating expense, does it not? Uh, uh, again, 100%. Uh, it, the, the way we approach it is, you know, the default position usually is, oh, we got to get a new machine. We got to get this. We got to get it. Well, if you can drill down far enough, you're going to understand what's causing the wobble in there that gives the issue. And most everybody, as you said, it's that one key employee that's been there from the flood. You know, he knows what causes the wobble. You know, so you kind of, you know, he, he knows how to tweak it. He knows the work around. And th th there are, I, I get what you're saying, but, you know, key employees like that that have the knowledge that bring it out. And you want to make sure nobody's afraid to bring it out. That's why the compensation of it. You find other work. The other thing is, if it goes that well as we talked about before, and, and your margins are improved, your competitive position is improved. What's going to happen is your sales are going to go up. So you know, you're going to find the work for that for that key employee. I, I don't mean you, obviously, Tim, but I mean they'll find the work for that key employee if that key employee still wants to do it. But get in there; he's going to save a lot doing it the other way. 100% agree with you on that, though. It doesn't take a lot of cash to do it. It just takes it takes time and it takes focus on your employees. Yes, it does, and it's it's always a, a change is always challenging. We had the pleasure of having uh, Barbara Troutline on our show at one point. We interviewed her about her book, and she made a fascinating statement. She said, 
the areas of the brain that light up for change are the same areas of the brain that light up for pain. And <laughs> that's why people avoid it. We were godsmacked. It was like, what, really? <laughs> wow. I, I, I must be some kind of masochist then, because I, I kind of love going in. I think it's a fun process. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I go back to your point on the kid. You're, you're it is, it is bring, a fun process. You're not going to bring kids in, as, as they're saying. Bring back to your point on kids, kids, you know, twenty somethings, even thirty somethings. You're not going to get them and stick them on a line and say, "Do as I tell you." That ain't happening. You know. In fact, yeah. you you want people to come in and start in an organized fashion, not chaotic, but in an organized fashion. We're going to start going after the hierarchy of the issues. Now, you, know, you can contribute. You know, let's get this done. If you want to do more stuff, fine. But at least we're going to go after, we're going to go down the line on these and you know, let, let everybody have a piece of it. To me, that's a fun organization to work for. It's not to say you don't check your brain at the door. You're coming in, you know, you're, 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 you're holistic. Yeah, very true. Uh, and this is why I've worked with Lou for 30 years, almost 30 years, is because his company is always rolling through change, always looking for ways to improve, thus the continuous improvement part of ISO, but it, always looking for efficiencies. We're working on a couple of projects right now that are you know, efficiencies within the organization. Take, take the process and digitize it and make it run smoother. That is, John, I agree with you, fun stuff to do. Yeah, it's, I'm, I, I've, I've forgotten about that. We did the same ISO certification. And, you know, initially, yeah, we did ISO. And I kind of liked it because we got everything documented. But you're right, the continuous improvement part came in afterwards. You know, what was that online? You can make concrete life preservers. Uh, and as long as <laughs> you get certified, if, as long as you follow the ISO procedure. Right, you know, but yeah, what about the continue the complaints of the customer, the voice of the so that was eventually added, that that part of it. So that's, um, I, I forgot about that. Well, that to us, the continuous improvement part is the central function, in our opinion, about ISO. And uh, action, and Tim, as Tim pointed out, that we are doing some several projects right now that are addressing exactly that. Uh, for example, we, we created our own internal um, uh, software program back in 2004. And I'll never forget the company that came, you know where I'm going with this, right, Tim? <laughs> yeah. uh, in 2004, the company said to us, well, this, this isn't really a big deal. We, you know, we'll do this, we'll do that. How much is it going to cost? He said, well, probably about twenty-five, maybe $30,000. Well, we're probably somewhere around three to 400000 right now, and we're still making changes. So it, it's uh, it just, and, but the return, as you pointed out, the return on that kind of an investment is huge. I bet you could go back and look at some of your numbers, your operating efficiencies or what it was when you first did that program versus what you would do right now. And it would, it would be staggering, you know, what the, what the difference would be profitability wise, margin wise, oh, et cetera. Had you, had you not made those efforts? Absolutely. Uh, I, I agree with you. We, we might not be here. That, I wasn't going to go that far, but that, that was about to come out of my mouth. Yeah, we might not, have been, and there are those companies today who are not there anymore because they didn't. They kept on making the horseshoes, right? The same. Yeah, way. you have to. You have to be willing to ask yourself the hard questions, even though it makes you really uncomfortable. That's process improvement. Just is. Well, I mean. Yeah. John, I like what tight line is. I like what yeah. tight line is doing. Where do you see yourself going? None of us are youngsters on here. How long are you going to keep turning the crank here? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to keep going for what one of one of the things we we started having some discussions is. Uh, <clears throat> while it's it's great to do this advisory or consultative, 
Um, I, and I, I'm, I, I am just about bordering Greenwich, Connecticut, where you know the epicenter of private equity in this world lives. <laughs> and um, they operate a little differently than the way we're talking about right now. It's not you know eliminating the need for costs. It's not obstacles to productivity. It's ripping the costs out in a lot of cases. And I, I say that with all due respect to a lot of buddies of mine that, that are in there and it's propping it up and it's waiting for the market to turn to get. And I just don't think that's beneficial as it can be to not just the individuals involved, but even the, even the good old US of A. And uh, so we're, we're, we're in discussions, maybe tight, tight lines advisors, the tight lines holdings and going out and acquiring ourselves using more of a Berkshire Hathaway model to be able to do that going forward, uh, as opposed to the you know, three to five year old flip, et cetera, you know, get in and get out. But you know, still some ways to go. I'd like to think I'm in decent enough health at 65. Uh, I mean, my, my insurance is covered. I got this great Medicare thing. Right? It seems, it seems, to work, <laughs> seems, to work, seems to work out pretty well. So 65 that's years what we'd like to do. And I, the, the other thing, Tim, uh, forgive me for, you know, belaboring this other point, Lou and I were talking about it the other day is right, wrong and different. Wherever you fall on the political spectrum, there is a ton of debt that this country of ours is burdened with at the moment for both parties, both sides, all the various reasons, et cetera. In 1945, as I understand it, I'm old, but not at all, but 1945, <laughs> as, I, as I understand it, the U.S. got out of the debt position they were in after World War II because they had a younger population that was getting older. They had a growing population, and the rate of productivity improvement was going this way. We don't have those first two, but we control that third one if we want to be able to do it. And the only way we're going to get out of this, to me, is to become a real big net exporter again. And just because people we want people to buy from us, they're not going to because we're in a high labor market. We've got to come up, we, sorry about that phone. I, I can get that in a second, but we've got to figure out a way to be able to get the costs out and improve all aspects of what we're doing to a level that we can ship overseas and bring those dollars back in here. And that's only gonna to happen to innovation and productivity. But I think the two go hand in hand. Well, the perfect example of what you're talking about is the, when Bill Clinton was in office, and he was promoting globalization and export, and he wound up generating the most recent debt-free surplus that this country has had in the last 30 years. And uh, I have a favorite saying, and I'm not sure Tim's in agreement, but I think you are, <laughs> that we have a national debt, in my opinion, is never going to be paid off. Uh, but we'll pay the interest, but we're never paying the debt. Uh, it may be, but I, I'm going to die trying at least, at least from the aspect of what I'm trying to do with the tight lines thing. Okay, the government could use you, I'm sure, in a great many of its operations. <laughs> All we have to do is read the newspaper and find out what they're doing, and it's their ability to screw things up is astronomical. It's daily. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Just do, do well, what we're John, talking about. I sure talk, appreciate you. I was going to say, do what we talk about doing in any department of the government, get that bureaucracy out of the way. It would be spectacular. I, I think I think a lot of it, which is full, I don't know what we're going to do with the bold people afterwards, but I, I think to be, you could really shrink government and make it more effective. Yeah. Anyway, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> That's okay. They're going to need they're going to need defibrillators in every closet. <laughs> people aren't going to believe the achievements that were possible. Right. John, thanks for joining us. We appreciate you being with us and sharing about Tightline Advisors. And I know that if I ask you to give us the website address, because I read the notes, it's going to be tightlineadvisors.com. Is it that simple? Dot com. Tightlinesadvisors.com. Now, everybody who's watching this show, we want you to go to to visit John's operation. John, thanks for being with us. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. A lot of laughs. It uh, has been enjoyable. And while you're surfing the web, stop by jacketmediaco.com, where you'll find this. And 
I think we're approaching or we've crushed it over Lou a thousand episodes between all of our podcasts and we're growing rapidly. So there's a whole wealth of information there. Well, something like that. And uh, being that 13 is my lucky number and we're now at 10 uh, years as of the 13th of this month of uh, November, uh, I got to stick around another three years. First of all, I'm too busy to leave and I'm too busy to die. So <laughs> I got to keep working. <laughs> so true. All right. So uh, you got to come and see our other podcasts. Uh, Wham, Women in Manufacturing, Cliff Notes, uh, uh, Manufacturing Matters, uh, Harry Moser with, uh, um, come on, Tim. Moser, Moser on Manufacturing. And our I buddy, knew you'd get it. I knew you'd get it. Our buddy, Dr. Chris Keel, who yeah. does the flagship reports, which is almost as enjoyable and funny as this one, John. <laughs> almost. He's, almost. He's, he's <laughs> almost the only economist because most economists don't have great personalities. Sorry, guys. Chris Keel, he could be a stand-up comedi comedian. And he's terrific, and we love dealing with him. He's on every month, like Harry Moser is on every month. Everybody loves Harry. And uh, come, come visit us whenever you get a chance. We're on every one of the platforms, your favorite platform. So take a listen, and uh, we'll see you next time. Subscribe to us on YouTube and bye for now. Bye-bye.